So we'll do a presentation on taking the next step with Git. And it's Karin Talge. A big applause. So, hello everyone. When I first decided that I was going to use a version control system, I did a bunch of research on Google to find out which version control system I was going to use. So I was working all by myself, and I didn't have a team or an access to a server, so the choice was quite natural. I was going to use a distributed version control system. So I went ahead and downloaded and installed Mercurial on my laptop. I don't know if you're familiar with Mercurial or using it. It doesn't seem to be very common in the WordPress circles that I've seen. And I felt really good about doing this. I had thought, OK, I've read about this version control. This is what you should do. And I downloaded it. And I felt, you know, you feel a bit geeky. You know, it's a command line thing. You install it. You should use terminal to use it. And I pat myself on the back. And I'm going to be a real developer now because I'm using version control. Except I never used it. It just sat there. I had done a bunch of research about which system I should use, but I didn't do a lot of research on how I was actually going to use it. So I didn't. I didn't change anything in the way I worked. I didn't incorporate anything into my editor or whatever. It just sat there. By the time it went on, I even forgot that I had it installed in the first place. I just moved on. Fast forward a couple of years, and I start to hear more and more about people using Git, and they're collaborating on GitHub. And I thought, OK, I'm, I'm going to do this thing again. I'm going to give it another try. And this time, I made a, really made an effort. Oh, there's a time when I should put, put off a sign. I really made an effort to memorize the basic commands to, to integrate it, I, did, I integrated it into my text editor and how I was going to use it. And I even printed out a little cheat sheet that I could have next to me so that I wouldn't have to go to Google for 10 minutes every time I tried to do something. And this time, it really paid off. I actually, <gasps> I started using version control. Now, I'm not going to do a big comparison of different version systems and which one is better than the other and the pros and cons and which one you should choose. Because usually it's a matter of personal preference and what's better suited for the project and what everybody has used, used before you and everything like that. But the truth is, the best version control system is one that you will actually use. My name is Karin Tolliga, and I'm a WordPress consultant at my own company, Fingers Destruct. And I'm going to talk about taking the next step with Git, but it seemed to turn black on me. And I wondered why. Maybe the adapter didn't work it right. Maybe I just wasn't patient. Look at that. Well, that's not the first slide that is. It's frozen. Nope. Doesn't do anything. Do you know? Oh, that's a bummer. It's kind of hard to talk about something when you have pictures, and there's no pictures. Look at that. We can do a minute that one. There we are. Look at that. Yay. Hello. There we are. So, if you're using GitHub, well, I'm going to start a bit like what I'm going to talk about because, well, I'm going to talk about branching model, the uh, branching strategies, and that's a bit about how to manage your code, probably a bit tips. Even for those who actually are quite used to Git, you, I hope you can get something out of it. But I thought this is going to be a, like taking the next step after you're getting a hang of the basics. So it's kind of just how to get 
straightforward. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about rewriting the history, because it's something that comes up sometimes, and how you do it, when you should do it, and when you should probably not do it, or rather, when you definitely not want to do it. So if you're using pull, uh, GitHub, then you're used to kind of, you're forced to do this pull request model. So you pull the code from your project to your computer, you work on it, and you push it back if you use GitHub to your repository, and then you are sending a pull request back to the original project. But it doesn't say anything on GitHub about branches. And it shouldn't, because every branching strategy is different for the project. Git is very flexible. You can use it in very many ways. So they don't enforce anything. And while the convention is that you name your remote's origin and upstream for your fork versus their fork, you don't have to. You can name the remotes anything you want, and you can name the branches anything you want. You can name the remotes after the planets and the branches for like the characters of Star Wars. You know, it doesn't really matter. So instead of you write push origin master, you would have like push Tatooine Luke Skywalker. Like you could totally do that. Git doesn't care, but. Maybe when you start to collaborate with others, it becomes a bit confusing. You need a shared set of conventions or expectations of where the code goes and from where you do a pull request. How many of you have heard of Git flow? Yeah, and using it in your own projects? Oh, I see quite a few hands. Yeah, then you probably recognize this picture. So, yeah and very readable too. But anyways, you've probably seen it. It's proposed by Vincent Driesen, and it's a kind of standardized way on how to use the branches when you work in a traditional release cycle. So basically, you have two main branches that are never deleted, which is the master branch and the develop branch. And the master branch is for your latest release, the stable code, and develop is where you develop the next one, right? And each time you have a feature or a bug ticket or something you need to work on, you branch off from develop. You create a feature branch. You work with that until everything is happy and then you merge it back to develop. And the reason for this branching model is they, they also have a release branch, which is the green one. When you create a release, you do the release branch, which is basically the feature freeze part of a project. Like no more features, only bug fixes and polishes from now on. And you work there and you, you test it from there. And when that is finished, it gets merged to master. And it gets tagged with a new version number. And also you merge it back to develop because you all want the latest bug fixes back to developing the next version. And the little red one, the little red dot is the hot fix. Like this, the urgent security fix that you need to do. So you do that from uh, the latest version that you have deployed, the latest version, and you merge, branch it off, and you create just a little fix, merge it back to master, and you tag it with the next, next point release, and then you merge it back to develop so that the next version also gets it. It kind of looks complicated, but actually it's not in a sense. But he developed a couple of scripts that you can use so that everyone is using the exact same steps for all of these things. This model is best suited when you have bigger projects that have a ver semantic versioning or bigger release cycles, that you have a feature freeze and you have a release mode and all things like that. It does, it's not really suited for everything, but it works well. Another one is what they use at GitHub themselves. That's why I call it the GitHub flow. They posted about this on their blog, and there is only one master or one, <laughs> there's only one master in all of them, but it's only one long-lived branch, which is master. And all of the topic branches goes off to master, and you merge back to master. It doesn't matter if it's a feature, or a tiny little bug fix, or something in between. You go off of master, you work, and then you merge it back. And for them, for everything that worked, like they name the feature branches, they're not called feature blah, blah, blah. I mean, they name it descriptively for all that's been worked on, and they push it up to their server. And the reason to do it, because on their server, they have hooked it up to a continuous integration server that run all their unit tests. So all the unit tests are run on the feature branches as well. I think they use Jenkins, 
If you have an open source project on GitHub, you can hook it up to Travis to do the same thing. And this means that when they're pushing up a feature, all they, they can see if it breaks the build or not. And then they send the pull request to initiate the code review. So somebody else is going to look at the code and they have a discussion about it and they make sure everything works because before they branch it, merge it into master. Because the golden rule is master code is always deployable. Either it was deployed pretty recently or it's going to be deployed pretty soon. So they are, don't have this version numbering. They are continuously deploying. It's a more agile environment. Like they're pushing code as soon as it's stable, they're going to push it up. So I think they even hooked it up to Slack bot so that they can deploy the code from Slack. Okay, we deploy this. So that's another way to go about it. But the both thing they both have in common is that they use topic branches for their work. They don't, neither of these systems, you don't work straight into master or straight on develop. You create a branch, no matter how small, and then you create a pull request. And the thing to remember is a pull request is from a branch to a branch. It's not like you're sending up a patch file. It's not like this commit, I'm going to send a pull request. It's actually the complete branch. So you can publish the branch and send a pull request and then keep adding commits to it, which is the reason for the code review. Like you can add it and have a question. And then they say, yeah, okay, I think you should do this. Okay, I continue adding commits. And it's the same thing with this continuous integration server. You pushed it, oops. It broke the build. Okay, I'm fixing it. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. Until you're finished and you think you're ready. Probably you should know you're ready. <laughs> and then you merge it in. And then after you've merged it, of course, you can delete that branch. Let's talk a bit about the log. Yeah. When you send a pull request, the log is the, the commit messages is what the person is going to read first. And it really is a good idea to think a little bit about how you're going to write your commit messages. It's quite easy after a while, and you're like, yeah, okay, finish the day, I'm committing everything. Oops, that's great. But it makes a difference. I'd actually even say you should try to avoid using the one liner. It's like, yeah, okay, I fixed it, that's great. A good commit message should start with a short summary and a blank line, because this line is what's going to be used when you use the short log, and it's one what's going to be read. So it's a short summary, blank line, and then a description of your issue. And there also, wrap it. So it's not like a huge long line, because so some terminals, they won't wrap it the code. So you wrap it nicely and format it nicely. You don't have to write an essay, but it's, you can say the diff, of the commit is what is what happened. And the commit message is why you did it. Especially if you're sending a pull request to someone else. Why did you do what you do? What is the change doing? And also include a link to the issue. GitHub and other places like most issue trackers, I think these days, have a way to automatically link. You just use the pound sign and the number and it will be automatically linked to the issue or whatever. But it's a good idea to write out the full URL because everybody doesn't know where the bug actually lives. And it's all, what kind of convention do you write it in the present tense? It's not like, yeah, I did this, I done that. No, like this commit, fix this. You write it in an imperative. And if you find yourself when you write the summary that you're using the word and, like I did this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this, then probably you're trying to put too much in one commit. A commit should be just like a function. It should do one single thing, a functional logical thing that you do because then it's easier to debug later and to revert. And one thing that helps in doing this is to use the staging area. So the staging area or the index is where you put everything that you want to commit. Like you can have several files that have been changed, but also only the files that you put in the staging area are the ones that are going to be committed. 
So there you can think before, okay, uh, this is the logical change. You, it's, it's easy to happen. You work a lot, you get into it, and you forget to commit. And then you realize, oh shit, I have a bunch of edits. Okay, but you can commit them in chunks. You can decide what you stage, and you can commit them afterwards. And the, sometimes the stage will work against you. Oh, okay, I'm gonna do this one first. You can add, say you have an edit, and you realize you've added the same file, and there's a bunch of changes, but actually parts of the file should belong in two separate commits. Then you use add flag uh, dash p. So you can choose which part of the file is going to be part of which commit. So I snipped the diff because it was <laughs> not going to fit on the screen, but you get a normal diff, like the plus and minus signs, what's in and what's out. And then you get the questions. Oh, you want to stage this? And here you get the answers. Yeah, I want to stage this. No, I don't want to stage this. Oh, quit, I don't want to stage at all. Or split it up. Parts of this is this one or this one or whatever. So you choose, okay, this logical thing, I'm part of this file, and then no, I'm not going to stage the other ones. I'm just wanting to commit this function. And then if you look at git status, you will see that the same file will look both modified and not staged. Both of them. So in order to see what you actually have staged, you will actually use uh, git status dash v or git diff staged, double dash staged. Then you will get a complete diff of what's going in the commit so that you will remember, what did I do again? Yeah, you can check it out before you do it. Oh, that's the logical change, I can do that. But the staging area is so can sometimes be tricky to think about. Sometimes you forget things. Like if you add a new file, you also need to track it with Git. You need to like add it to Git so Git knows about it. And maybe you forgot to do it and you say, oh, okay, I'm gonna commit all the changed files. But you forgot the last one. It doesn't really, <laughs> it's the fifth one on the bottom. You forgot it. You can amend the, f the last commit you did. So you add the file you forgot to the staging area and you just say git commit double dash amend. Which means take the last commit and add this staging area to it as well. I, I'm redoing the last commit, oops, I made an error. You don't have to have all this oops typo thing. This kind of commits you don't need. You can amend it, you can correct it. And I don't know if you can see clearly, but the two commits they get different hashes because you have changed the history. You have removed the commit and added the new one in the way it works. Whoops, I'm gonna fly out here. So it's a new hash, it's a new file, even though it's the same commit message. So like the previous commit has kind of been deleted. It's left hanging. It will be deleted when Git does garbage collection. It doesn't exist anymore. When you have amended a commit, you have created a completely new one. So this is the first array into rewriting history, but it's not really destructive because it's only on your machine. You did something and you changed it. That's no, no biggie. But when you talk about changing history, usually you're talking about the command use rebase. And when do you use rebase and what is it for? Well, say you have here a development and you have the master branch and you created your feature branch. And then development continues on the master branch and you want to integrate the de master development into what you have, what you're working on. And you, sure, you can use merge, but there's a kind of benefit of using rebase because it will just move your branch to the tip of the feature branch. It will take all the work you've done and reapply it on the latest work on the master branch. 
And this has actually benefits. It's good because the history becomes linear. Instead of having lots of branches and merges in between them and everything can become confusing. You just simply move it on the end, you work it out and you can see if there are merge conflicts and you can make all the edits you want and make things perfect. And then when you merge it, you can make a fast forward commit. It will just be whoop, pulled into master and nothing problem, hopefully. No problem will happen. But the same thing applies here you are creating completely new commits. These old commits, it's not like they are moved, they are actually destroyed, and new ones are created due to the way Git works. And this means if somebody else also worked on that feature branch, you just deleted their history. You just deleted their branch. So while this workflow, if this rebase thing is very good to do when you have a local branch and you're working locally. Before you push it, you can do a rebase. But as soon as you've pushed it and somebody else has cloned it, don't touch it because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of problems. In essence, Rebase versus merge. I didn't make a pretty picture of the merge thing because I believe most people know how it looks like. Rebase is something you use only when you have a short-lived topic branch on your own computer. You can rebase as much as you like. It makes the history cleaner, but you can't do it if somebody else has worked on it. Merge is non-destructive. It just adds. It never removes anything, so it just uh, keeps adding on top. But if you have a lot of merged commits, then your history is going to look like, oh, I did this, merge to master, did this, merge to master, master to branch, feature to master, merge this. So it can be harder to see what's going on. Uh, no, I'm not going to say, oh, well. Rebase can be a lot of, you have a lot of power in rebase. And I didn't plan to go into the more detailed works because what you can do with the interactive rebase is you can completely do anything you want with the commits. You can squash them together, split them apart, you can do whatever you like. But the same thing applies there. Don't ever do it when somebody else also have the branch because that's gonna really mess up things. So in summary, choose and follow a branching strategy. If everyone on your team likes Star Wars and everyone works with that, fine, go ahead and do it. But it's a good idea to at least, even if you work for yourself, decide what you're going to do and commit to it. So that, as with everything, collaboration like, with other developers could just as well be with your future self. When you come back to the project in half a year, you should kind of remember what's going on. And convention really helps. Take advantage of the staging area so that you can really make sure that the commits are logical and only do what they want, they want them to do. Be mindful of the history, writing a helpful commit. Like I said, don't, don't have to be an essay. Doesn't, I mean, if it's a typo, you don't have to write, oh, I've corrected a typo because there was a typo and I'm a grammar Nazi. You, know, you don't have to do that. It's just take care and write something that makes you understand in the future. And never, ever rewrite history on a shared branch. So that's it, actually. Thank you. My name is Karin Ho. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I have questions for me. I know I have a tendency to talk fast, because now we're really. <laughs> yeah. oh. Can you pass the mic? Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, when you're using Git for your WordPress projects, what do you put in Git? Are you using the whole uh, installation of WordPress or just a theme when you're developing a theme? Um, when I use for clients, I'm using just the theme or the plugin. I have done putting everything in it and deploying with Capistrano, and it's an old project, and today I probably would look into Composer because um, I did it with sub-modules and stuff, and that's really... Uh, I wouldn't do it today, but I did that. <laughs> thank so, you, thank you. Yeah. Hmm? 
I, mean, I think it's also for the recording. Because yeah. then you get so the question in the recording. Uh, otherwise, uh, the recorders, the recorder guys will be really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, have you integrated Git with uh, Composer? Anything? I haven't done so much with Composer, no. Okay. Not yet, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like on my to-do list. I'm going to learn Composer properly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's what question down there, so pass the mic. When you're pushing only the theme to Git, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that the whole team shares the same uh, uploads, files, and everything else in the installation? The the same. Are you talking about the whole? Yeah, if you're not publishing the whole WordPress installation to GitHub. Well, it was, I I'm not sure. We can I publish the theme. I mean, I put the theme in. Uh, what I've done for clients, they have a theme in GitHub, and then I'm actually uploading it manually because they haven't done that kind of thing. But when I have the whole WordPress repo, yeah. in yeah, I'm using Capistrano. Okay. So then I'm telling Capistrano to pull from because they have a host that uses Git, so I could do it. Okay. So then I told Capistrano that okay, I'm going to pull this version, so then it does it. So it, Capistrano will pull from in make his Bitbucket. So I'm telling Capistrano which version is the last one, and then it's going to pull it and integrate it, and then yeah, it works a bit differently. So it's removing <coughs> symbols and stuff like that on the server. Any more questions? No? Yeah? Are you using any uh, um, graphical uh, um, to uh, uh, representations for Git? Uh, I had, sometimes I use source tree from, uh, I think you call it, uh, this guy's doing, yeah. It's a, because I decided I'm going to do it by the command line, that's what I've learned. And then I've used source tree to visualize the branches, basically, to see like what's going where. And then you go like, OK, I understand what they mean with the history thing. Um, but like all these things you can probably do from there. I'm not using it, but OK. Yeah. Would you recommend using the terminal instead? <laughs> I'd recommend it basically because that's more you're guaranteed to be cross-platform. But as long as you understand the the main thing that you're doing, you can use whatever graphical interface you want. It's just that if you don't know what Mariba does and you just click a button, then you might screw up something. You just need to know what's going to happen. So for me, the way I work, I use the command line first because that's how I do it, but you don't have to, certainly not. Thank you. Right. So thank you. I guess you have a very, very long coffee break.